Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Yeah, I know I'm not in my usual location. There is a bit of an echo in this room, but I hope that's uh, okay. Uh, so I wanted to mention just two quick things. The first is that we are still looking for donors. We are at the halfway point of what we need in terms of monthly donors for Justin Sinner. So if you have not contributed and you're thinking about it, I would encourage you to do that. Go to justincenter.org and go to the donate page there to find out more information about how to become a regular contributor. If you want to give a bigger one-time amount, that would be fantastic as well. It is needed for all the things that we're doing, including the Widener Institute. So the second thing I wanted to mention again is that we are offering a course on the doctrine of justification in June. So that is now less than a month away as I'm recording this, that we're going to be starting that. I'm teaching that course. We're going to be speaking about the doctrine of justification, a lot of contemporary debates surrounding justification. We'll be talking about the Finnish approach to Luther interpretation and the relationship between justification and union with Christ. We'll be speaking about the new perspective on Paul and Gerhard Ferdi's doctrine of justification. And all of that will be rooted in what is the classic reformational, specifically the classic Lutheran approach to justification as we outlined there. So if you do want to sign up for the course, the cost is $99. So you should sign up soon because these spots are filling up. It is limited in terms of how many people we can allow in the course. And you may want to get a hold of the books beforehand as well. So there's a syllabus. Go to justincenter.org. Go to our Widener Institute section. You can find um, information there, even on the front on the front page actually of justincenter.org. Currently, at least as I'm recording this, the the first thing on the site is information about our our justification course. So, go ahead and check that out. If you want to purchase previous seminars and courses that we have done, you can also find those on justincenter.org on the Widener Institute site. You can go to past courses and find uh, the course I taught on Lutheran scholasticism on the history and theology there. You can, you can purchase it. And you can also purchase a seminar that we did with Dr. Nathan Greeley, who is our fellow of apologetics and philosophical theology on the natural knowledge of God in Johann Gerhard and Thomas Aquinas. And uh, that is something that is you know, when there's a one evening seminar, it's $15. And so that way, if you start with that, you can kind of get an idea of the kind of things that we are doing. We've got a couple upcoming seminars as well. We're trying to set dates for that with a couple people that I'm, I'm bringing in that I think are going to be really exciting on, on really important topics. So uh, that's the background that I want to give you. Those are my announcements for today. I do also, along with those announcements, want to say I have an, I've had a number of you send me links to a couple of responses to things that I've done. One of those is the Reason and Theology podcast has responded to the first of my programs on prayers to the saints. So that's something that I haven't listened to the whole thing yet. I just listened to the beginning of it. Um, my series on prayers to the saints is just started. So we're going to be dealing with some of the historical information. We just did kind of an introductory podcast. We'll get more into depth on that. We may be responding to some of those arguments there. I've been invited as a guest on Reason and Theology. I have not been on yet, but uh, so perhaps we can have a good conversation <clears throat> maybe surrounding that or another issue at some point in the near future. So look forward to that. The other thing that I've been sent quite a bit is that uh, Ancient Faith Radio on there, which I listen to all the time, uh, is just, which is an Eastern Orthodox radio station. I listen to their music very regularly, their, their chants and, and uh, divine liturgy and things like that on a pretty regular basis. So uh, they have a number of blogs though on there. And one is a, a Reformed Orthodox Bridge blog, which deals with Reformed criticisms of Orthodoxy and converts to Eastern Orthodoxy from the Reformed tradition. Somebody responded to my video, Five Reasons Why I'm Not Eastern Orthodox. It was certainly much more charitable than what you'll find in someone like Jay Dyer. But it, uh, <clears throat> I've been asked if I would respond to that. I'm probably not going to. And I think the reason for that, that I'm not going to respond to that post, it was very respectful and, and well done in some ways. But there was a lack of understanding of my own position on a number of issues. For example, there was a lengthy argument that I did not believe in theosis. I've written a book on theosis and defending theosis from the, the Lutheran tradition. So he hadn't done the research in terms of where I'm coming from. So the responses, I think, were more assuming a Reformed perspective from me, which is really not where I'm coming from. There certainly are similarities in some areas, but not in other areas. So because of that, I think that if I did a response, it would probably be more so focusing on clarification of where we're coming from on certain things more than a kind of refutation of what his arguments are. So, I mean, if you all really think that I should do it, you know, if you find it valuable, I can, but um, I don't 
necessarily think that I'm going to be doing that. I also had a number of people reach out to me because Matt Slick on Twitter offered to debate me on baptismal regeneration, and a bunch of you want me to do that. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. I've said before, debates are not really my favorite thing to do. Uh, I just... I don't know. It's not my favorite thing to do, but maybe I'll do it. So a lot of you seem to want me to do it, so I may do it anyway. With that being said, uh, with those comments there, I want to talk about this, the subject today. And the subject today is one that I have been asked about more than any other subject recently. For a long time, I was receiving constant comments and uh, emails and you know comments through Twitter, all sorts of places asking me to do something on Eastern Orthodoxy, specifically uh, five reasons I'm not Eastern Orthodox after I did the same thing with Roman Catholicism and with Reformed theology. And now that's shifted in that once I did that, now all of my, well, besides the debate J. Dyer comments, the most common things that I get are asking me to respond to Leighton Flowers. I'm constantly asked to respond to Leighton Flowers. Now, if you are not familiar with Leighton Flowers, as I'm personally not that familiar with him. His, he has an organization called Soteriology 101, and a lot of his listeners listen to my podcast, apparently, because I'm told that in emails that I get often, that people are listeners to Leighton Flowers and his podcast and his YouTube videos. He is a, a Baptist and a proponent of provisionism. Now, I had never even heard of provisionism before. I didn't even know what that was. I'm not sure I still even know what it is. And I'm repeatedly asked to deal with his material. Now, the reason I haven't dealt with his material, first of all, is because I don't know what provisionism is, and I would have to just do a lot of research. His YouTube videos tend to be very long, so there are multi-hour videos and posts and podcasts. I just don't have the time to delve into a subject, a new subject that I haven't done. Um, you know, at this point, I'm doing these things on my own time <laughs> without payment. So I just don't have the time to research any of this to any large extent. I've got other projects, book projects and things that I'm working on preparing for courses. So it's not that I don't want to respond, but I just don't have the resources to do it. People keep asking me to respond to Ken Wilson and his work on Augustine. What I've seen of Ken Wilson's work of Augustine and the arguments that he makes specifically with baptismal regeneration are very weird and I think completely inaccurate. I don't know how the guy got a PhD from Oxford, but with that being said, I, of course, all sorts of people get PhDs from all sorts of places. It doesn't necessarily mean they make good arguments. But with that being said, if I was going to make a real response, I don't want to make just a response to you know interviews or videos that are out there, though I, I could do that. I would rather really take the time to read his dissertation as well as his popular level work on Augustine and Manichaean Gnosticism. But I just, at the time, I don't have the time and resources to devote to it. So I'm not going to respond to it. I want to do it act adequately. But what I did want to do today, since everyone is asking me, and with the the qualification here of me saying I have not listened to an extensive amount of Leighton Flowers. I just haven't. So know that as I'm going into this. What I was sent was a video that is 15 minutes long and it's on the subject of total inability or as Lutherans what we would call the bondage of the will in response to Calvinism. And it does seem like this is the area that a lot of people want me to comment on. In particular, the argument that, that I'm seeing is that what Leighton Flowers is presenting is not a historic Arminian position even, but what he's presenting is more of a, a semi-Pelagian, or some pe people have even accused it of being a Pelagian position on the freedom of the will. And I think that it, it is helpful to make a differentiation between what is semi-Pelagian approach and then what is the Arminian approach. Uh, Roger Olson's book, Arminian Theology, Myths and Realities, is really helpful here in outlining what is a historical Arminian, specifically more of a Wesleyan Arminian view, and contrasting that with what you find in a lot of popular evangelical circles. And the, the differentiation between Arminianism then and, and semi-Pelagianism, and I have read the original semi-Pelagians, by the way, John Cassian being the most prominent of those, 
the and, and I've read a bit of Wesley as well, not so much Arminius, just little little sections of Arminius. But what you find in both Arminius and Wesley is a contention that the will is in bondage to sin, whatever language they want to use to refer to that, and that there is this prevenient grace that frees the will, so that there is a necessity in grace coming prior to the will choosing the good. So within the classical Arminian tradition, and remember that the Arminian tradition does come out of Calvinism, okay? The Arminian tradition is within the realm of Reformed theology. In some ways, Arminius is probably more of a Reformed theologian than certainly more of a Reformed theologian than someone like John MacArthur would be. In that, he's still coming out of that, of Calvin's tradition. He speaks very highly of Calvin. He agrees with Calvin in terms of his perspective on the sacraments and ecclesiology and things that someone like a John MacArthur would not, but it's particularly in the area of the extent of the atonement, especially in response to someone like Theodore Beza, who I think goes a bit farther than Calvin, that Ar Arminius and then the Remonstrants respond and create what becomes the Arminian theology or Arminian, Arminian movement. But within that, they're still holding on to some of the reform distinctives. And one of those is what is just a reformational distinctive as a whole in terms of the magisterial reformation. Now, the Anabaptists are a different story, but the magisterial reformers, whether Luther, Melanchthon, Calvin, onto Arminius, all accept that the human will is bound to sin. In other words, they are all working within that classical Augustinian tradition. Now, I know that what Flowers is going to be critical of is the Augustinian tradition as a whole, but Arminianism itself is within the Augustinian tradition. You could find these different categories of Augustinianism that go back even to the early church. So you have Augustine, who is a double predestinarian to an extent. Now, there's some debate, I think, in terms of well, I know there's debate because there are articles and <laughs> debates, of, they exist about what Augustine believes in terms of the of double predestination or the extent of the atonement. There can be an argument that he's more Calvinistic, but he never quite defines exactly what reprobation is or what the nature of that negative side of predestination is. It's not really until his later writings that even addresses that issue very much. And when he does, I don't think it's that clear. So then further theologians kind of develop that more. Someone like Thomas Gottschalk is more the forefather of a more Calvinistic or really strict Augustinianism in terms of a double predestinarianism as well as a limited atonement. And that, but that's not till the ninth century or eighth century that that happens. And there's a ninth century debate surrounding Thomas Gottschalk's uh, theology with a number of different figures, Retramnus of Corby and Lupus de Ferriere and, and some others. So under Emperor Charles the Bald, really unfortunate name <laughs> to be known as for the the rest of history. You are known as the guy who was bald. But uh, hey, most of us won't have names that will be remembered at all in history, so eh, it's not that bad. Um, so we have the more strict Augustinianism, which becomes adopt, which is adopted by the Reformed tradition. And then we have the more moderate Augustinianism or the modified Augustinianism, which we have in Caesarius of Arles, St. Prosper of Aquitaine's later writings, and then the Council of Orange, which then, at that point at least, is the position of the Western Church. I mean, we have a pope saying this is the position of the church, which is a monergistic Augustinianism, not a strict double predestinarianism because that's rejected in the Council of Orange. And that's kind of where the Lutheran tradition comes in. Then you have with Gregory the Great, so we're talking around 600, a kind of lessened Augustinianism, where, which is he's the first figure post Augustine that formulates within the Augustinian tradition an approach that comes to a perspective of something like prevenient grace. Now, I'm not actually aware of where that term first starts. I'm trying to think if Gregory uses that term, and I don't recall running across that, that particular term. But he speaks of something, because prevenient grace just means grace that comes before. So uh, the notion in Gregory is that there is, a, there is human sin, and human sin is there by birth, and therefore the will is bent towards sin, and there needs to be an act of grace for a, an individual to choose to become a Christian in any sense. So grace precedes our choices. Okay, it's not without our wills or without our choices, but that has to be preceded by grace. So those, and that becomes then what is the Arminian position later. So whether Arminian, Lutheran, or Calvinistic, all of those perspectives are within the Western Augustinian tradition to some extent. 
So if Flowers is rejecting the Augustinian tradition altogether, he's also rejecting classical Arminianism. And this is where he comes in with this idea of, of provisionism, which I, from what I've seen, now people can point me, because as I've said, I'm qualifying this highly to say I am not an expert on Flower's perspective, but it does appear to be the approach of the semi-Pelagians. Now, the semi-Pelagians, John Cassian is the first who's labeled a semi-Pelagian. Prosper of Aquitaine is the one who comes up with that terminology. He calls him a semi-Pelagian. He writes to Augustine at the end of Augustine's life, and he's like, these guys are teaching the Pelagian heresy. You know, he's, he's a bit extreme at that point in his life. He calms down a little bit <laughs> later in life. But at this point, Prosper's kind of limited atonement in some ways. At least there's one statement in his writing against Cassian where he certainly affirms a limited atonement in a double predestination. And he says, these guys are the semi-Pelagians. They're just the same as the Pelagians. They're heretics. He's the cage stage Calvinist. Okay. I mean, that's really what Prosper is. We see, it's, it's funny because you read Prosper's early and later writings and you see the same journey that the Calvinists come through today. It's your, you're this cage stage, angry Calvinist. And then all of a sudden you kind of calm down and maybe temper your views some and maybe come to a more moderate Augustinianism and become a Lutheran. So I don't know that that's what I did anyway. So it's interesting to see that people have kind of been going on that, that theological journey for so long, going back into the fifth century. But Augustine responds, Augustine is not as harsh as Prosper toward those perspectives, but he does demonstrate that there are errors in, in Cassian's view. Now, what Cassian says is that the will precedes grace. He does say at certain times grace can precede the will. He gives the example of St. Paul and his conversion. But he says oftentimes the will of its own power can choose the good, and then grace takes over at that point. So the question then largely is, which is first? Which is primary? Is the human will first in the decision we make, or is divine grace a necessity? So it's in that question that what I see in flowers here in this video is the semi-Pelagian position. Now, I don't know the history of the term provisionism or where that comes from, but I can tell you in terms of historic categories, going back to the predestinarian debates of that era, as, as well as in the ninth century, that is considered the semi-Pelagian position. And that's the perspective that Flowers is taking. So with that, in this perspective of total inability, with all of that background being put there, now I want to look at exactly what he says. So the question we're asking is, is there an inability of the human creature apart from grace to choose that which is spiritually good. That means all people are born fallen and therefore cannot even spiritually see, hear, or understand the gospel appeal to be reconciled from that fall. Yeah, and I think this is just, you know, this is true. What, what he outlines here, if you read Luther's The Bondage of the Will, that's certainly the perspective that Luther is coming from, and that's certainly the perspective that our confessions are coming from, and that the entire Augustinian tradition is coming from, including when you go back to someone like Arminius or John Wesley, so that, yeah, there is this spiritual blindness, and there are so many texts scripturally that speak about this. We are born dead in trespasses and sins. We are blind. No one seeks God. Uh, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Th this, these kinds of phrases are used repeatedly throughout Scripture. Now, the argument that he's going to make is there's this only happens as a punishment for someone's resistance. Now, that is a category that is scriptural as well. We'll talk about that. But that is certainly not the only context in which statements like this are made. So, yes, there is a spiritual blindness one needs to be born again before they can even see the kingdom of God. So yes, there is a blindness. I mean, part of what sin does is it blinds our minds. We are born in the position that sin has this impact upon us holistically so that it has impacted our wills, it impacts our emotions, it impacts our minds. Every part of the human person, every part of the human creature is distorted and messed up because of sin. There is not one aspect of humanity that is somehow left intact, whether it's the will or the intellect or the emotions or something else. Now, we can all agree with our Calvinist friends that we are born without knowledge of our Savior, and therefore truth must be revealed before we can believe. After all, Paul himself says in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The implication of this question is that if we do hear the gospel, 
we may believe it. And if we believe in him, we may call on his name for salvation. Now, I think it's odd to kind of point this out as an area of, of agreement, because this is an area of agreement with everybody. And so what's, what's being posited here is that the issue in terms of people not believing the gospel is not an issue of them having a blindness that is inherent in them because of the fall, but that the issue is just that they don't have the intellectual information or they just don't have the facts of the gospel. And the assumption I assume here is that if they have the facts of the gospel, then what happens is now they can make a rational decision to accept that those facts are true and believe and come to saving faith. So the assumption here is that the gospel itself or what Paul is talking about when he expresses the need of preaching the gospel is just that the proper information needs to be delivered so that people have the proper information. And then in light of that can make a right and good autonomous, seemingly free will decision to believe that those facts are true and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be a good Baptist. No, I don't know. So it, this is the Pelagian position. See, this is the problem is this perspective is the Pelagian perspective and any Pelagian, Pelagius himself, uh, and there are more Pelagians other than Pelagius, Augustine writes to many people who calls Pelagians and get that label afterward. But the Pelagian position is essentially that God's grace is that which concerns knowledge itself, because God was gracious enough to give us a message of the gospel that we can be saved. God was gracious enough to give us or reveal to us his moral law so that we can obey that moral law and be saved. So what he's really giving here is nothing in these debates whatsoever. And this is essentially the Pelagian position to say that the only problem is one that we don't have the knowledge that we need. And once we have the knowledge, that's all you need and you can make a free will decision. But is the, the, the thinking in terms of what the gospel is here too, is that the gospel is simply information, right? The gospel is information that's delivered you hear the information and now you've got a full set. You can use your mind and intellect and make a right decision. But the gospel, the power in the gospel, remember, it is the power of God unto salvation. And we can look at how scripture speaks of the efficacy of the divine word. But the, being the power of God unto salvation does not just mean that it delivers the proper facts to us so that we can make a right decision for salvation. The gospel being the power of salvation is the idea that the gospel actually it brings about salvation. The, the gospel is not just a message of facts. It's not just a message of information. It's not just an invitation, but the gospel is the power of God. It is something in which the spirit himself is at work in that message to bring spiritual life. So the gospel is not bare information. The gospel does what it says. The gospel brings us into faith. The spirit is active through the word and through that activity in the word, he is present and creates faith in our hearts. What this does is make the gospel powerless because the power is not in the gospel. The gospel is just information. The power is in us to make the right decision once we get all of the facts straight. So this is an extremely problematic to frame this whole thing. And what I do see here is essentially a Pelagian approach. But you understand on Calvinism, even if the gospel is plainly spoken, the lost person is spiritually unable to see, hear, understand, and repent in response to that gospel appeal. Because on Calvinism, this is a condition from birth, or what would be called a natural condition, which means people have no control over it. Just like you cannot control the color of your eyes or your skin, so too you have no control over your spiritual blindness from birth on the Calvinistic worldview. So grammatically, wouldn't this be in Calvinism rather than on Calvinism? I don't know. It sounds odd and confusing. But the problem here is he's saying, well, this is in Calvinism. No, this is not just in Calvinism. This is in the historic Augustinian tradition. And I know he's opposed to the historic Augustinian tradition, but this is something that has been held to by classical Arminianism, that's been held to by Lutheranism, that's been held to by Calvinism. Yes, it is the case that there is a spiritual blindness from birth. How can you deny this? It's very clear, unless you're going to come to a complete Pelagian perspective, which I don't, I don't know, maybe he is, but 
Scripture is very clear that we are born in trespasses and sins. We are conceived in iniquity. So that there is this deadness spiritually from birth, and that means something. So what does it mean? And how, if there is a spiritual deadness, what does that affect? What does that impact? What is the impact of sin? If it doesn't mean that we are spiritually dead and spiritually blind from birth, is sin just kind of hamper our will a little bit so we can make bad decisions? That's Pelagianism. So let's see if he gets any further on and explains with any more nuance exactly what he's talking about here. But are people really born blind and unable to see spiritual truth? Or can they become blind by choosing to close their eyes and harden their hearts? Now this I think is just one big false dichotomy. Are they born blind or can they become blind? Well, scripture speaks about two different realities. So certainly there is the reality in scripture that there is a continual hardening of the heart as a judicial punishment for rejecting, rejecting Christ and rejecting the message of the gospel and rejecting that which is good. It's very clear in Romans 1 that God hands people over to their sin. So there is this, and this is what the, the Lutheran scholastic tradition refers to as a judicial hardening. So that there is this judicial hardening of heart. There is this God giving people over to their sin. And certainly that's the case. You see this with the example of, of Pharaoh that Paul draws on in Romans 9. But when you see the example of Pharaoh, there is both this Pharaoh hardening his heart and then God hardening Pharaoh's heart. This is a judicial punishment. He is continually resisting God's grace. So he is given over to the continual hardening of the heart. But that is not, that does not somehow say that there is no spiritual blindness from birth. Yes, there is a spiritual blindness from birth. Sin has an actual impact on us from our birth. It, it impacts us in profound ways in everything that constitutes who we are. Not taking away our humanity, we still have the essence of, of what is human, but all of that has been marred by sin. Scripture is extremely clear about this in numerous places. And you know, hopefully in further discussion, we can get into particular texts and maybe just exposit very specific texts that speak about this, but this is kind of more of a general discussion that we're doing, in at least in this in this video or this episode here. So, when you're you're speaking about that, there is a spiritual blindness, and to those who are spiritually blind, the gospel is offered, and there is a resistance to the work of the gospel, and that can lead to this judicial hardening. Now, what he seems to have in mind here as he's speaking about this is basically there are only two perspectives, okay? Two perspectives. There's the his perspective, which appears to be at least a semi-Pelagian, maybe Pelagian perspective. And then on the other hand, there is the double predestinarian Calvinistic perspective. And in reality, the majority of the history of the church, going back to the early church through the Middle Ages, through even the post-Reformation era, it's still the case that the majority of the church falls in between those two perspectives, but that view is not even being allowed to exist in this false dichotomy that's here. So in that view, specifically I'm thinking of, of a Lutheran view, because that's where I'm coming from, we can confess that there is universal grace that the Holy Spirit has does work through the means of grace. So the Spirit works through the gospel. So the gospel is not the bare delivering of information. The, the gospel is the power of God, as Paul says, unto salvation. The Spirit is present in the word of the gospel, and the Spirit works through the word of the gospel to bring people to saving faith. But that doesn't mean that he does so irresistibly. Okay, So the Spirit works through the word of God to create faith, but does not do so irresistibly, meaning that there is the possibility of human resistance to the word of the gospel. So if a human rejects, if a human, because of their sinful will, rejects the word of the gospel, they can, through continual rejection, be handed over to the realities of their sin. And this is that judicial hardening that is clear in numerous places in scripture. Romans 1 is a great one, and looking at Pharaoh is another. What Flower seems to do is say, well, either this is true or this is true. And because there's this judicial hardening, therefore, there is no spiritual blindness from birth. And that's a complete false dichotomy, which the majority of the church in history has not fallen to, that false dichotomy. So he sets up these completely two opposed positions and says, well, because one part of this isn't true, therefore, this is true. 
And that's simply not the case. He's not allowing for nuance in these discussions at all. Let's look at a sermon in Acts chapter 28 by the Apostle Paul, who is preaching an evangelistic message to a group of Jews, some of which come to faith, and others who refuse to believe. And let's see what he says is the reason for their resistance. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses, and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Did you notice that Paul spends all day trying to persuade his Jewish audience? But why? Uh, this music is distracting in this video. I, <laughs> it's hard for me to pay attention to the words while this music is going out of the background. But nonetheless. So the argument here is because Paul pers tries to persuade people to believe, therefore it is not God's work in bringing people to faith, that this is just a rational exercise of apologetics and that's it, so that you can rationally convince someone by a proper argument that they can believe and that's it. You know, this again, this is a false dichotomy. The majority of apologetics in the history of the church have been done by people who also confess that it is ultimately God's doing in bringing somebody to faith. So the notion that God brings people to faith and has to enlighten the mind, what we call illumination, this is part of, at least within the Lutheran tradition, part of our ordo salutis or our order of salvation is this, this idea of illumination, that there is an illuminating of the mind that has to occur for someone to believe because of the intellectual impact of sin, or what the Calvinist teacher referred to as the noetic effects of sin. So the, the impact of sin on the human mind, there is this enlightening of the mind. And this enlightening can come about in a few few ways. So the Lutheran tradition is, if you look at someone like David Hollatz, he has this distinction. There are basically three ways that illumination happens. Well, for, uh, first, there is this pedagogical illumination. And this is the idea that the spirit can use logical argumentation to bring people to faith. So this is not just a spirit devoid process of the human intellect, but the spirit can work through rational argumentation to break down some of those intellectual barriers. And I think what you'll see in terms of intellectual barriers to the faith, there's, there's really spiritual barriers there. The intellectual barriers can be there, but there's really something underneath that that is pretty much old, not pretty much, but it is, I think, always the case that there's more to it because of the spiritual hostility that we're born with. It's not just intellectual, but that's part of it. So that there is this kind of pedagogical illumination that can be a process of bringing people to arguments and the spirit works through argumentation to enlighten the mind and enlighten the intellect and help the intellect to work properly. And as the spirit is engaged in that, when the intellect works properly, individuals are going to come to a knowledge of what the truth is. And so we see an example of that. The other two kinds of illumination, um, we have legal illumination, which is an understanding of sin and the law. And then we have the evangelical illumination, which is a the conversion, the understanding of the gospel and what the gospel is. So that the spirit works through each aspect of the human person. He works through mind, will, and emotions. These are all parts of, of how God made us. So when he is doing the work of conversion, he is using each of those. So because you bring up the fact that Paul... I mean, did people not realize this? You know, in history, have those in the Augustinian tradition never seen that Paul tries to debate with people? I mean, what is Augustine doing all the time? You know, Augustine himself is quite an apologist. He has arguments for the existence of God within his writings. And we see within the Augustinian tradition following him, we have people like Anselm and Aquinas who are doing the same thing. They're not doing that without an understanding that the spirit is active in this process of converting the will. So this is a very strange, strange notion that Flowers is getting at here and doing this. So yes, the fact that there is a persuasion on Paul's part does not mean that this is a purely intellectual human autonomous process, but instead we recognize that the spirit uses the human intellect. I mean, isn't this the way we understand scriptural inspiration? When we're talking about scriptural inspiration, we know that the spirit is active, but the spirit is active in inspiring the word of God, but also using our human personalities and human language and human argumentation. That doesn't mean that it's devoid of the spirit or that it's just human reflection on the spirit. Not that he's saying that, but 
you know, I think there is a reason why Arminianism pretty quickly kind of delved into lower views of scripture because of, of the notion of the will and things like that. But that's kind of another discussion altogether. Why work all day long trying to persuade people to believe if they cannot see, hear, or repent, apart from some supernatural work only effectually given to his elect? So, you know, I'm not reformed. I'm not coming from a Calvinistic perspective, but this is not a good argument against, against Calvinism. So just the, the only way that this works is if you believe that regeneration, the work of the Spirit, is completely spontaneous and completely devoid of any means of grace or any ordinary means whatsoever. This is the case in hyper-Calvinism. This may be a good response to the primitive Baptists or something who believe that there is no connection between the work of the Spirit and the means of grace. So it is the case in the historic Reformation tradition, this is true in, in Reformed and Lutheran traditions, is that it is understood that the Spirit works together with the Word of God to convert. Now, there's going to be a difference between the two traditions in terms of what that means for you know, the non-elect. Lutherans aren't really dealing with the category of the non-elect or, or the reprobate because we're speaking about a universal grace, a universal desire for all people to be saved. The only reason for one's non-election is not because God has chosen not to save them, but because of their continual resistance of, of God's grace. But from the Calvinistic tradition, that's, that's not the case. But even within the Reformed tradition, there is certainly an understanding that the elect are saved through means to some extent, unless you're going to that extreme position, saying that there is no place for any external word at all. And yes, there are some even within the Lutheran tradition that would say that, yeah, apologetic argumentation, persuasion, none of that is valid at all. We need to preach the gospel, not defend the gospel, because the gospel is the power of God, and it doesn't need our defending. So, but that's not historically where either of those traditions are coming from. So that is really not much of an argument at all. I, I don't think it proves anything. I, I was kind of surprised because of how how much you know I hear about flowers, and I I know Dr. Flowers listened to the debate that I had with with Chris Date and. He seemed confused by my position, which is understandable because Lutherans are confusing. I don't blame him for that. We have an odd position in that when you're dealing with Calvinist Arminian dichotomy, our view just seems really weird. It takes some time to kind of figure out exactly what we're trying to say. I don't think it's as complicated as they make it, but when you're thinking in these binary categories of Calvinist versus Arminian or provisionist or whatever perspective you're coming from, then, then it does uh, become confusing. But I know he listened to that debate and he had some comments in the chat and, and things like that. And, and I appreciated his, you know, kind of willingness to listen and, and ask questions. But I really did expect from him a, something a little more, I don't know, because of his impact and how much he's he's praised by a lot of people. I expect I didn't expect the kind of argumentation I'm seeing here. I think it's pretty poor. Now, perhaps that is, it, again, I've made this qualification many times. That may just be because this is a short, simple video. And maybe he has I'm sure he has got all these very long discussions. So I'm sure he gets more in depth into these arguments, but at least on the surface level, it does seem like a pretty weak argument, not very strong at all. I believe Paul is persistent with the people of Israel because he loves them and longs to see them all saved. We see this selfless love expressed in Paul's letter to the Romans. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel, brothers and sisters. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Now, is Paul more self-sacrificially loving and merciful than the Lord who inspires his words? By no means. So this, again, this really, this argument has actually nothing to do with the question of total inability, which is the subject of this video. And it seems like a lot of what he's doing is saying, again, this false dichotomy of either this or this. And so if he's tying inability or the bondage of the will, as we would refer to it as, if he's 
tying that to a very strict double predestinarianism, which says that there is no universal saving will on behalf of God. And he says, well, the universal saving will of God is there in scripture. Here's an example in Paul. Therefore, this other thing is wrong. Those two things are not necessarily connected. So he's not sticking with the topic of the video. Let's deal with the topic at hand, which is, does scripture teach this total inability? Does scripture teach in several passages that there is a spiritual blindness on part of man as we are impacted by the fall? Or does it not? Let's deal with those texts. But he's kind of bouncing all over the place to these other discussions. So th this discussion, yes, Paul desires that his people, he says he'd be cut off from Christ for the sake of his brethren. And this is a passage that if you look at someone like Theodore Lenski or other Lutheran commentators, they're going to spend a lot of time dealing with this passage in that this is a real problem, I think, that there is within at least the very strict Calvinistic system, a strict double predestinarianism where there is no universal saving will in God at all. How can Paul honestly say this? And is there then a, a total division between what humans desire and what God desires so that God does not in any sense desire the salvation of the reprobate, yet Paul has this strong desire for the salvation of the reprobate, this inconsistency between those two things and how Paul speaks and what is true of God and what we are called to do. You know, this, this question also gets into, you know, does God command us to do more than he does in that we are called to love our enemies, but God only has eternal wrath and hatred toward his enemies because Jesus does use God as the example of love of enemies because he says we are to love our enemies for god himself provides good things for both the righteous and the wicked rain it gives all sorts of good things to, to both and we see you know the psalmist kind of getting frustrated about that fact several times in the psalms so yes th that is a valid question to raise when you're dealing with a very strict double predestinarian calvinism and we can discuss that but that does not get into the discussion that's at hand and this wouldn't even be true of all Calvinism. I mean, you look at the hypothetical universalists. They're, they're going to believe that there is a desire for God for the salvation of all people. In our tradition, we certainly would say that because we would say that there is that it's human resistance that results in their rejection or their lack of salvation, not a desire in God in any sense at all. There is no decree of reprobation there is a decree that those who reject Christ and live in sin will be punished, but there is no individual decree of reprobation in a double predestinarian sense. So this, this argument doesn't really play on the question of inability whatsoever. It's just not under discussion at all. Jesus himself expressed this selfless kind of love for these same people. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. This. So Matthew 23, 37 is going to be one of the major verses that people use to argue against Calvinism. And it's a verse that I would use. I, I think it's a very strong verse. I think that the Calvinistic interpretations of this text that try to just kind of skirt around the plain meaning by saying, well, it's not really about salvation. It's about the leaders of Israel rejecting the prophets does not really address what the text says in that it doesn't really answer any questions, whether that's true or not. What we do see is that there is a desire for Jerusalem to be gathered. There is a desire on the part of Jesus reflecting his father for something to be true and be the case. And yet human resistance has made that not the case. Whether that's individual salvation or the overall rejection of the Jews, of the prophets, specifically the leaders, those two things, I think it's a false dichotomy to say it's one or the other. It's very clear that I think that both are intended. They're part of the same thing. Well, why is it a problem that the leaders rejected the prophets? Because 
the prophets are preaching about repentance and salvation and the coming hope that is in the Messiah. So the, you can't dichotomize between those two things. So yeah, I think that that is a very clear example of one of the places where scripture is clear that we can indeed resist God's grace. There is a place for resistance of God's will. How I would, but you would not. There is an allowance of humanity to resist something that God has willed. That's true. The text says it. Calvinists, you can deal with that in whatever way you want. But I agree, this is a problematic text. There's a reason why that text has showed up in a lot of these conversations. But that has nothing to do with the question of the video. This has nothing to say whatsoever about be, the fact that you can resist God's grace, which is here in this text, has nothing to say about the question of inability at all. It's just not there. So what I'm seeing here is, again, this is something that I see as problematic so many times is that there is such an either or position that exists within contemporary evangelicalism that really disregards so many of the historic categories of the church, the, the whole church, the Catholic church, but also of even the Protestant tradition as a whole. And so that there is no place for nuance. But when you know that our position exists, and there's been a lot written about it, then you don't have to deal with these false dichotomies. These arguments are not strong. They're not good arguments. So when you see historically that, oh wait, it can be the case that what scripture says about inability and our being born in sin and blind, that can be true. But also all of these things about God's desire for all to be saved, that can also be true. We don't have to take one set of scriptural passages and use that one set to deny that the other set has any meaning or reinterpret them to mean something that they clearly don't. We can actually hold to what all of scripture says very clearly without having to reinterpret certain texts to fit with what we think are the other predominating texts. This is a reflection of the heart of God the Father, who said, Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people. Paul is simply reflecting the loving heart of God by trying to persuade his fellow countrymen all day long. Let's look back at Paul's sermon in Acts 28. Yeah, so... This, again, this is the same problem that we see earlier. Yeah, that's that's true. There is a universal desire of on God's part that the wicked are not destroyed, that the wicked do not face eternal death. That doesn't play into the question of total inability that this video is supposedly dealing with. It's just not there. And even within, if you look at the history of Calvinistic interpreters, the majority of Reformed interpreters do hold that there is a universal sense in God's saving will in passages like this. I know that in some popular authors, those texts are denied. If you look at The Potter's Freedom by James White, for example, he tries to reinterpret nearly every universal text to mean something different. That's not even the case if you look at From Heaven He Came and Sought Her, which is the most in-depth treatment of the doctrine of limited atonement today, and probably the best argument for it that exists. Yes, I've read it. I certainly was not convinced by it, but it is the best contemporary argument that exists. If you read through that, those authors are not willing to just totally take away the universal text. They're trying to wrestle with them. So what just pointing to passages like this do really only do is respond to a very narrow, more extreme, strict kind of Calvinism. But what they're not dealing with is the majority of Christians who believe in total inability, which would include Lutherans, Anglicans, classical Arminians, Roman Catholics, uh, and more moderate Calvinists. That's a big group of people, and they're not going to come from the perspective that Flowers is coming from here, but he's not even really interacting with those approaches. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Notice what it says. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. 
they would not believe. That is a deliberate act of the will. So that's true. If you would not believe, that is a deliberate act of the will. I don't understand what relevance that has to the topic at hand. Because, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of the bondage of the will is to say that we do work in accordance with our will. The sinful human creature does have a will. They don't not have a will. They act in accord with what is their sinful nature. If that's the case, of course they're going to will that they don't believe. That's the whole point. <laughs> that's the whole point of the bondage of the will. So what what is the point of this? That there is an assumption that if you can, if the sinful creature can use their will to reject the gospel, therefore the sinful creature can also use the will to do that which is good apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that the argument here? One of the best evangelists spends all day trying to persuade you of the truthfulness of who Christ is, and you refuse to believe it. That is an act of the will. This is much like those spoken of in Romans chapter one by the apostle Paul who he describes as suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness in verse 18. They're the ones who exchange the truth of God for a lie, as we see in verse 25. And as a result, in verse 14, we see their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. In verse 24, what happens? Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Notice it doesn't say they were born already futile and darkened and given over. But this is a result of their suppressing of the truth and exchanging it in for lies. So at least from this video, I think Flowers is a Pelagian. I, I, I mean, maybe you can point me to where he's not because I haven't done, I, again, I haven't done a lot of research on Flowers. This sounds like Pelagianism. This really sounds like Pelagianism. So the idea that one only has a darkened sinful heart because of their resistance of their own free will that they choose. That's what results in all of this. That's Pelagius. I mean, this is Pelagius' interpretation. That this is straight up Pelagianism. I'm kind of I didn't real, I actually didn't realize it was going to be as bad as, as this. So this is kind of my first jumping into this. This, wow. That I, I'm surprised. And I know some of my listeners will be like, well, yeah, we've been telling you this forever. Sorry, I haven't dealt. This really, this sounds like Pelagianism. Wow. I, I don't even know what to say to this. This, interesting. That's what I can say. Yeah, it's true. Of course it's true that people are handed over to their sin. That's not the issue at, at hand here. No one ignores those texts. Of course that's the case. Yes, people are handed over to their sin. But the question is, is that the result of an inborn condition? that then that there is a, a resistance of the will and a darkening of the mind that is through birth, that as we hear the gospel and resist that because of our sin nature, that this can then result in a handing over of God to those lusts that are ultimately a result of what we are born with. And that doesn't mean we're not making conscious choices. So this is weird. The fact that he points to all these passages that talk about resisting God's grace I mean, what is he thinking that the Calvinistic position is that God, people aren't resisting by their own will, that God is like forcing them to well, without them? I, I don't understand what he's even responding to. The, the position that he's trying to knock down, I don't think exists. And he's done so many hours of this. This is new. This just came out. How, how does he not get this? I, I, I'm confused. Because they suppressed and exchanged the truth, their hearts grew defiled and darkened so as to be given over to their lusts. Paul says, quote, they are without excuse because they knew God and his eternal attributes were, quote, clearly seen and understood. How could the truth of God be clearly seen and understood if they were born spiritually blind as the Calvinistic system teaches? Calvinist. I mean, this this text plays a very central role in the natural law tradition, which largely is indebted, indebted to Augustine and then Thomas Aquinas within the Augustinian tradition. And then the reformers take that over. There's a very strong natural law tradition within classical Lutheran two kingdom theology. You see this a lot in Luther's own writings. If you look at his Genesis commentary, he's got statements regarding this. If you look at what he writes to 
um, the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire, or the Germany, really, at, at the time. And the later tradition developed some of these ideas as well. So and what someone like Gerhard will do, being the my favorite theologian of, well, ever. So uh, <laughs> what Gerhard says is that he makes a distinction between this innate knowledge of God that we all have and this acquired knowledge of God. This innate knowledge of God demonstrates itself very clearly in the notion of the law being written on the heart. So there is a, an understanding that there is a, a moral law that is written on the heart of all people through birth. And this is why the Gentiles do the things of the law, even though they do not have the written law as Paul expresses. There's also this acquired knowledge of God that through creation and through rational argumentation and through the observation of the world around us, we can and do come to the conclusion that God exists. Now that can be suppressed, but there can be truths found in pagan philosophers. So they're going to, you know, the historic entire reformational tradition whether Lutheran or Reformed, Anglican, they're, and Roman Catholic, they're all going to do the same, which is point to the fact that there is an ability on behalf of one who is endowed with natural reason to come to conclusions about God's existence. That doesn't mean that there is an ability of the human free will to come to spiritual truth and spiritual knowledge of God that is saving. What that does is, yeah, it's necessary in terms of civil society. It brings people understanding that God exists. We can't know his triune nature. We can't know the gospel because the gospel is really, Luther makes this point repeatedly, is that when he speaks about things like reason is the devil's whore and he's very critical of, of reason, what he's talking about is the gospel. We can never discover the gospel through reason. Our reason operates well enough that we can discover that the world as a contingent thing is dependent upon something eternal. And that is the conclusion that, you know, Plato or Aristotle came to. And that's the case. We can know certain ideas about God, but we cannot have saving knowledge of God through nature. So the only way that this argument makes any sense is if the perspective that he's coming from is to say that because you're blind spiritually, that means that reason itself is not operable in any sense, which is not the position of those who classically hold to what is the bondage of the will. They would believe that, yeah, there, there is this place for natural reason. The, the fall sin has not meant that humanity is no longer humanity. We have, this is dealt with in Article 1 of the Freedom of Concord, a debate within the Lutheran tradition after Luther over the question of what is the essence of man? Can we say that the essence of man is sin? And the conclusion of the, the formula of Concord is no, we can't say that. The essence is still humanity, but we're marred. So to say that we're blind does not mean that our reason doesn't work at all, but we can't have saving knowledge of God. Paul is not, the point of Romans 1 is not Paul saying, yeah, you can observe nature and come to saving knowledge of God because your reason works so well. The point is people are condemned. They're born in sin. Yes, he's going to get into that in chapter 3 especially. And so they're even condemned both by that internal law that is within their hearts that they're born with, but they're also condemned by that external observation because they see that God exists and they are accountable to him, but they don't know the gospel through nature. So that does not even interact with a position that exists to just cite that passage. It, it's disappointing. I'm very disappointed in all of this. So yeah, that's, we're about at the hour. Um, that's what I have today. I could have gone through more of the video. I, I knew I wasn't going to get through the whole thing, but just some of the basic arguments. This is really bad argumentation. Uh, just straight up, it's bad. It's not good. It's not convincing. It's very clear that there is no real understanding of either historic Calvinism or the entire Augustinian tradition, including the classical Arminian tradition and the classical Lutheran tradition and the Anglican tradition, which tends to kind of draw on all of those in some ways, or even the Roman Catholic perspective. So this is not, it's not a good argument. It's not strong. It, it does not 
I'm, I'm really disappointed. I, I really expected something more with more depth. I expected something probably more like a Roger Olson approach that, that would have really at least dealt with the position better, more in depth. And, and I know this isn't supposed to be in depth because this is just a very cursory kind of 15 minute video. So I know that. So I'm not expecting in-depth exegesis, but even in terms of what I heard here, there was just the position being argued against. First of all, it was not the position was not the question that the video started with. It just gets into all sorts of other things. But then it doesn't even reflect the classical reformed position on any of these issues. So, you know, and I know Calvinists like to throw around straw man all the time. I get that all the time, right? Anyone who critiques Calvinism is accused of setting up a straw man. That's just no matter what you say. I think some people don't even look at what you say. They just say, oh, he critiques Calvinism. That's a straw man. Or they're always going to say, but I'm a Calvinist and I don't believe that because there are so many perspectives within the broader Calvinistic world that you're always going to be misrepresenting somebody because you can't represent every single position unless you nuance everything you say with 20 minutes of exposition. So, so I get that, right? But this really was a straw man. You know, I, I don't want to throw that around a lot, but this really is. It's not good. It's not good. I, I don't understand the reason why this is this guy's influential. So maybe his other videos are much better. I don't know. But yeah, I, I know people have wanted me to deal with this forever. I haven't had the time. This was a poor video. It's a poor argument. If you want me to deal with more, which I know you do, maybe I will. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me know your comments, questions on this. I have a lot of other things I'd really rather dive into. I've got some things I got to finish. I'm going to do one more program on justification. I've got another one on prayers to the saints that I'm going to get more in depth on. And I'm going to continue that discussion of baptism. A lot of you really liked that and want me to delve into that more. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you don't already, make sure to follow me on Twitter and Facebook. It's it's at Jordan B. Cooper or wait, it's at Dr. Jordan B. Cooper. I changed it because it was Justin Center was my Twitter handle, but now it's the organization's Twitter handle. But follow the organization, Justin Center as well. Go to facebook.com slash Justin Center. If you go to justincenter.org, sign up for our newsletter as well, and you can get updates about all sorts of things that are going on. Again, we are still looking for contributors. If you want to help out, even in a small way with that, that would be fantastic. And make sure to check out our upcoming events and courses. And check out our books as well, just jspublishing.org for some of our publication. So we will see you soon. God bless.